gotten their math side, they've done their minimal math. So all the grading should be up there. I should have the grades copied over for everyone that obviously used the group method. So that should be good to go. Um, if you're had, if there's any issues that you guys think there is just, um, I don't know how grades have been imported or otherwise, just let me know. And I'll make sure that gets uh, remedied. Um, so that being said, you know, looking at the performance there, overall pretty happy with it. Um, a lot of you guys did really good. Some folks uh, struggled. There seemed to be a direct correlation between the amount of struggle and the attendance uh, to lectures, which is interesting because you say that and there's only 10 of you currently in the lecture, though a little over 20 students in the class. So, but like anything else, if you guys are having questions, you guys need help, just let me know. And we'll be more than happy to work on it. So we're gonna keep on diving in and moving forward with now we get to talk about the joys of the lower extremity. So first up, we get to go ahead and talk about the hip. So the hip itself, the joint, it's going to be the combination of the effectual ball, which is your femur and the socket, which is going to go ahead and be what's known as your acetabulum. So from there, it's very stable because it's a very deep socket that that ball is inside, unlike our shoulder, which is a very shallow one. Uh, Anouk, you are unmuted, just so you know. And this is good because we're going to be able to produce a lot more power. However, due to that obviously being a deeper joint, we're gonna naturally see a lot less range of motion than we're gonna find compared to our shoulder. And that's gonna be due to a myriad of reasons. We have a lot thicker cartilage in that area. We've got a greater amount or lower hydrostatic pressure. So that's essentially gonna go ahead and keep it inside. And also that's gonna allow it to effectively be lubricated. And once again, it's much deeper. So if we're gonna be looking at this from either the posterior or the anterior, we see how we have these giant ligaments that are gonna be working to effectively keep that hip in the socket. And you can see as, as you'll move your leg around, we're going to be twisting these ligaments over each other, which in turn is gonna keep even more force of driving it into the socket and not letting it go out. So this tension in itself is going to, once again, keep it moving and at the same time, keep it from dislocating even more so when we're at end ranges. So I'm really trying to push that leg really far in one direction, other flexion, extension, um, abduction, adduction, you're kind of naturally always limited. And so we also have bursa and these are gonna be little fluid uh, filled packets effectively that are gonna work as pads. So some that's gonna be the bottom of our hip bones. So that's probably what, uh, that's what I'm sitting on right now. That's what a lot of you guys are sitting on. And then also bursa that notice it's gonna be around different muscles that are gonna effectively being, or that are translating down and then inserting. So once again, decreasing friction, allowing things to move with a lot greater ease. So now the femur, which we've alluded to a moment ago, is hands down the longest bone in a normal human body. It is in turn gonna be the largest and it should be the strongest bone you have. Now, the weakest point of it, however, is the femoral neck. So we've got the shaft, we've got the trochanters, we've got the neck and then the head. That neck is going to be where we've got a much greater risk of injury. In fact, uh, Bo Jackson, um, that's what effectively he broke. When they talk about breaking your hip, it's usually a breaking of this femoral neck right here. Now, the hip itself is actually gonna be made up of a number of different bones. The actual hip bones itself is gonna be composed of the ilium, the pubis, which is the bone that you have on the front of your hip, your ischium, which is what you're gonna be sitting on right now. And then remember the sacrum is actually part of the spine. Now, the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium are fused together. The pubis symphysis, that is where we're gonna have a little bit of cartilage and it's gonna connect on either side. And then we're gonna have what's known as our SI joint, sacral ilium joint, where we can possibly, we get a little bit of movement, obviously too much, you can talk about an SI joint sprain and that is super uncomfortable and things that I would not wish upon nearly anybody unless, you know, they're a real, real jerk. I have an x-ray of my hip in class one, they see 
Um, Colton, can you repeat that? Because you sound, the your sound's coming through really poorly. Um, I have an x-ray of my hip back in class. I wanted to see. Yeah, go ahead. If you want to you wanna send it to me and I can uh, show it off, so to speak. It's no worries. Um, but yeah, check your microphone when you get a chance. So one thing to keep in mind is that the pelvis of one individual is gonna be different to another. So how high these iliac crests comes, how broad the hips are gonna be in general, the angle that effectively our acetabulum is gonna be facing is all going to be genetically influenced. Now, on average, women have wider hips than men, but that's on average. Some women actually have narrower hips than men. And that's gonna come down to literally just genetics and how that's gonna influence our own natural bone structure. And this isn't so much a bad thing or a good thing, but it is important to keep in mind when we're going through, and just like we could see differences in the AC joint uh, that we talked about briefly, this means literally due to your own genetics, your own biomechanics are gonna be a little bit different thanks to just literal variations on how we develop. And so depending on what type of hip joint you have, this is where you're gonna have some folks that are far more comfortable squatting with a narrow stance where other folks are gonna be far more comfortable squatting with a wide stance because once again, depends on how those femurs are going to move. So how we move our femurs in turn are going to be affecting how we're tilting our pelvis. So anterior pelvic tilt is when our pelvis is going forward. Posterior pelvic tilt is when our pelvis is going backwards, excuse me. And then lateral, now we're talking about shifting side to side. So when we're trying to effectively flex, so let's lift our knee up, we're naturally gonna put ourselves in pelvic tilt. It means naturally as you're lifting your foot up to try to lean back with it. When we're trying to go into anterior pelvic tilt, that's when we're extending. So we're gonna be pushing our leg behind us as far as we can. And then obviously with lateral abduction, lifting the leg out to the side, you're gonna see the hip naturally lift itself. Think about somebody doing like a, you know, like a roundhouse kick or one of those style kicks in martial arts. Now, the muscles that are contributing to flexion at the hip, so that's gonna be lifting your leg up, is going to effectively be done by really what's gonna come down to four different muscles. The iliacus and the psoas, which are gonna be more deep iliacus, which is literally inserting, inserting into our ilium, our psoas, which is going to be inserting in our lower, in our low back, uh, where, sorry, its origins, and its insertion is actually gonna be in your femur. Now your rectus femoris, and that is going to be the center topmost muscle of your quadricep, and what is known as your tensor fascia latte, which is gonna be a hip flexor on the outside of your hip. It also can work a little bit with effectively um, abduction. Now, you're also gonna get a little bit of work from your pectineus and from your sartorius. Uh, those are gonna be far, far less, but consider effectively your major four are going to be the iliacus, the psoas, rectus femoris, and your tensor fascia latte, just call it TFL. It's gonna make it a lot easier for you guys to remember, plus you don't have to worry about spelling. So when we're talking about, there's that origin of our iliacus, there is going to be our insertion, origin of our psoas, insertion of our psoas, rectus femoris coming on through. Now, our sartoria, sometimes uh, referred to as the cobbler's muscle, is gonna be going across from effectively the iliac, the anterior ili iliac crest, all the way down into actually our tibia. So not just gonna lift the leg up, but it's gonna also internally rotate our leg. Now, once again, TFL is gonna be the bigger one. Now when it comes to extending the hip, so extending the hip is gonna be being done by our glute max and then the four muscles of our hamstrings, our semitendinous and membranous, which is going to be inserting into effectively the uh, medial aspect of the tibia. So notice it's a two joint muscle. Then our bicep femoris where the long head is a two joint muscle, but our short head is a single joint. So this is not just going to extend the hip, but as we're gonna learn in a few moments, it's also going to work on effectively flexing the knee. So trying to bring your heel to your butt. Now, all together, 
we want to use all of these muscles, obviously, obviously to extend the hip when we're talking about sprinting, jumping, lifting, et cetera. Now, the key thing is our glutes are going to be really important for everything we do. The problem is a lot of people are pretty bad at using their glutes because, well, they spend all day sitting on them. And that starts to translate into what is literally known as gluteal amnesia, which literally means people are forgetting how to use their butt, which is kind of funny yet kind of sad at the same time. So the basic idea that we want to make sure we're doing here is making sure athletes, anyone is always going to be properly innervating the motion. But this is one that you seem to find a lot more egregiously, uh, along with obviously postural deficits, which we've talked about before when it comes to things like kyphosis. As I literally lean forward as I'm teaching you guys in my office, it's easy to mess that up. Okay. Now, remember hamstrings, once again, two joint, and that's going to go ahead and also give us knee flexion and hip extension. So it really comes down to what part of the body is going to be moving, what part of the body is going to be being stationary. Now, as far as our general movements at the hips, okay, when we're talking about A, B, duction. So we're talking about lifting our leg up out to the side when we're standing forward. That's going to be being done mostly by our glute medius, but also being assisted by our glute minimus. So this is a drawing from the posterior, and then this is a lateral drawing. So you can literally see how your minimus is directly underneath your medius, and then your maximus is going to be right on top of that medius. Now, the reason we care about abductors is they're very important just to make sure that we're supporting ourselves when we're walking. So when all of your weight is on your left foot, you're going to find that your abductors are firing to keep your pelvis level with the ground while you're working. Now, some folks, due to issues with effectively, you know, innervation of these muscles, neurological, otherwise, you're going to see where they naturally have to lean while they're walking because they're not able to get those muscles to fire effectively like they need to, to stabilize. So we really do care about abductor strength, and it's going to be important also to abduct, get those knees out whenever you're doing movements like squatting, because you're not trying to make our knees kiss and other potential negative effects. Now, we also then have obviously our adductors. Now adductors are gonna be also slightly important in extending the hip when we're in very, very low positions. So this is why you can obviously have some pretty solid adductor soreness after doing some pretty heavy squatting. Now we've got a number of adductors, magnus obviously being the largest one, longus, brevis meaning the shortest, and then gracilis, which is actually gonna be a two joint, but another relatively thin adductor. Now. The pectineus and uh, this over here should actually be the glute minimus. Don't worry about those so much, but these are gonna be what's actually helping pull our knees together, which is going to be an important component when we're trying to do things like change direction, uh, like we're trying to pivot because we're trying to stabilize our, or make sure our knee angle is appropriate by utilizing our ab and adductors to make sure that the knee is effectively in the arrangement it needs to be. So we're not applying that shearing twisting force on our knees, specifically our ACL, if at all possible. Now, the next group of muscle we have are going to be what's known as the pelvic floor musculature. So obviously, looking from inside of somebody's body on down, we can see that we're going to go ahead and have a number of different muscles that effectively are keeping our internal organs and otherwise from just dropping out the bottom. Now, why do we care about our pelvic floor? Well, because it's going to be, once again, what's stabilizing your intestines and a number of other organs that happen to be in your wonderful torso from falling out the bottom. So there needs to be an appropriate amount of effectively, well, really we'll call it both strength and flexibility, but the ability to actually have these muscles firing with enough tonicity that effectively we're not peeing ourselves when we're having to walk a little bit. So how many of you guys know of some lady who uh, typically after childbirth, like they will not get on trampolines or anything like that because anytime they do so, they're always peeing themselves a little bit.
Okay. Now, like if you're squatting low enough and otherwise, now we're talking about actually applying more force in it. And to be completely honest, guys, every single real lifter I know has a story that effectively goes with. And at that moment, I realized if I was going to make that lift, I was going to have to shit myself. And that's usually due to the really, really high pressures. And then obviously they're not able to keep enough, uh, shall we say, yeah, enough static contraction of the pelvic floor to keep things from going through. So it's never normal to pee yourself. It's important to remember from now and forever, whenever we're working with anyone, that we need to make sure that we have enough muscular integrity and strength that effectively we're not having issues with controlling our bowels. If that ever is happening to you or someone you know, this can be due to some major issues with compression of spinal nerves. This can be due to major issues with obviously perhaps some tearing or other trauma that's occurred due to things like childbirth. However, making sure that you understand that these muscles can be trained like any other. So the goal for a lot of individuals should be if they do have this issue, there's literally PTs that actually specialize in it. Because it turns out if you're peeing yourself just because you jumped, it's going to make you a lot less likely to participate in a lot of sports and physical activity, which is really too bad. And so like anything else, trying to make sure that people aren't going to have disaster pants and understanding it, these muscles need to be trained like any other. Now, this is obviously from the bottom up, and we can see, once again, how all of these muscles are going to go ahead and come together, and they're effectively going to go ahead and be keeping ourselves effectively with enough tonicity so that we're not going to have any issues with anything effectively, shall we say, slipping on through. Yes. Thank you, Igor. Now, we then have what's known as lateral rotators. So now we're gonna be going and rotating the hip outwards. So if you're standing up, this can be your feet turning out, okay? This is gonna be being done by our piriformis, our superior and inferior gunellus, and our obturator internus along with our quadratus femoris. Now, this is a good thing because we're gonna naturally be rotating that hip so think about, you can, oh gosh, they would literally be doing, using something like a hacky sack where you're gonna to try to internally rotate your hip. But this naturally internal and external rotation of the hip is going to occur when you happen to be doing things like changing direction. Because once again, we're trying to make sure that the knee and effectively, the knee is stacking up in the appropriate angle over the foot so that we're not going to be damaging it. So when we're talking about global things with the body and it's easy to see it when we go to the elbow. So the elbow is just meant to be a hinge. You know, the wrist, we've got a lot more choices. The shoulder, we've got a lot more choices, but the elbow is just meant to be a hinge. And so the basic idea is we want to use our shoulder and our wrist to line up our elbow so it can just work as a hinge as opposed to having it go and press through an acute angle, which is how you can do some damage to those tissues. So we want to make sure that we can do that internal and external rotation at the hip. So that way our knee is gonna be in proper alignment over our foot. So we're gonna go ahead and be able to push through. Now, when it comes to medial rotation, this is gonna be mostly done by our glute minimus. So this is where now we're talking about turning on in with the foot and our TFL along with our outside muscles of our hamstring and our glute medius are all going to help in assisting this. Now, this is gonna have nowhere near the same amount of strength as those lateral rotators. Now, we then have horizontal AB and adduction. So literally as you're sitting there, adduction, pulling them together, abduction, pulling them apart. And so if we're talking about horizontal abduction, now we've got those hip flexors, we've got our TFL, and we've got our hip adductors, or abductors, sorry, glute medius and otherwise, glute minimus as well. Now, when it comes to our horizontal adductors, now we've got our iliacus and our psoas that are pulling us through along with, notice our wonderful adductors themselves. So, like anything else, the muscles that happen to be on the back side of the body, just due to the natural stretch being placed upon them, are going to be able to produce a lot more force in this position. 
So this is where you're gonna get even more of a training effect out of those hip abductors than you're gonna be getting out of that TFL because it's in a shortened position. Same thing with our iliacus and our psoas. Now, anytime we're moving around, we're always gonna have a certain amount of weight going through the hip. So all weight that happens to be above the hip is just additional load that we're gonna to have to deal with with compression. So when we're just walking through, we can easily be talking about two times body weight. When we're going upstairs, we're getting over two and a half. Going downstairs, because we have to stop ourselves, that's gonna be even greater. And then obviously, if we're gonna now go and increase to doing something like running, we can be literally be talking about easily 5X body weight. And in certain sporting events, we can be getting close to 10X when we're doing things like diving, maximal jumping, or maximal loading. Now, we actually are gonna have a greater amount of hip loading when we're wearing hard uh, soled shoes because they're not gonna compress as much. So we have to deal with those forces going through our body. And if we're going to go ahead and carry weight on one side of the body, it's gonna be the opposite hip that's gonna deal with that greater amount of loading because turns out we've gotta do more on that support phase to keep ourselves in the correct position. And remember, we've got those obliques and otherwise contracting also torquing on that hip. Okay, so effectively these are gonna be averages. So there's always gonna be plus or minus on this depending on technique and otherwise. And so if how these uh, sort of figures are gonna come up is just based on just good old scientific experiment. So for those of you guys that have had the chance to come into the lab and do the vertical jump, the takeoff and the landing, well, we could literally just have you guys walk in place or if you had a much, much nicer treadmill, you could have, there's certain treadmills that have a force plate inside of them. So you can literally look at the forces going through vertically and horizontally when someone's walking on the treadmill, as opposed to jogging and then running. And so when you then take those forces divided by the body mass, this is where you're gonna go ahead and be able to get those percentages and figure out what's going on there. Now, once again, that's gonna be based on averages. And so, you're still gonna see an increase just depending on technique. Some people might not increase as much as others because they run a little bit softer. And then some folks are gonna go ahead and naturally do with greater forces because they effectively run a little bit harder. In fact, I'm sure all of you guys know somebody where, or you've ever lived in a apartment where there was people on the floor above you and you just feel like all those people ever do is stomp around everywhere they go and the reason I say that is you're like, my God, those people must be very big to be making that much noise walking around their apartment. And then you meet them for the first time and they're small people. And it's like, are they just like clogging or something up there? Are they practicing the river dance, tap dancing? I don't know, but that's gonna be the force going through. Yeah, exactly. Just driving force through the ground, not exactly the best at absorbing it. But they're having a good time. So as we're increasing speed, the loads increase because we have to produce more force in order to, remember force equals mass times accelerate, acceleration, if we want to accelerate faster, we have to produce a greater amount of force, straight up. There's no way around that. Now, the other thing we haven't touched on before in this class is drag, which is going to be obviously when you're running that force that you're getting against you from effectively the drag of the air around you. And as we go faster and faster, we encounter greater and greater drag, which in turn requires greater force production just to maintain those velocities, not even to accelerate any further. So, um, heel strike is actually not the best way to do uh, really efficient. It's more and more, more midfoot strike. And, but also when we do touch with a bent knee, bent ankle, and obviously, a flexed hip. So that way we're able to effectively absorb those forces as we happen to be going on through. Now, the hip is designed for massive loads. You just need to be careful of all of our tissues have a certain amount of resilience. So we can train them, beat them up, and then give them a period of time to recover and then go ahead and train them up again. Now, if we apply that stress more frequently than it can handle, now congratulations, we're going to go ahead and have more issues. However, if we're going to apply that stress appropriately and frequently enough that we're going to recover fully, we're going to go ahead and get better. Now, obviously we can outrun any tissue's ability to recover, AKA 
someone could ru run into your hip driving a big old pickup truck and just shatter it to pieces. Now, the body doesn't have the recovery capacities in order to go ahead and repair all that damage. However, you could be, I don't know, nudged by a truck once a day, every day for the rest of your life and be okay. It's coming down to the intensity and the volume of loading. And that's gonna give us information on really what that tissue can tolerate. So there's a number of different common injuries you're gonna have. Most of it tends to stem obviously with that femoral neck because of that weak point. So when we talk about people breaking their hip, remember guys, it's usually here breaking that femoral neck. And then sometimes you get what's known as an intertrochanteric fracture. So it's through the trochanters on the edge and the same type situation. Now you're talking about being in a cast and if it's bad enough because of brittleness, now we're talking about hip replacements. And obviously it's something that does have to happen for a number of people. Just because that has happened doesn't necessarily mean, obviously it's a great long-term solution but it is a solution. Uh, the reason I say that is usually hip replacements have to be replaced again at some point um, and preferably, you know, avoiding that if at all possible, because it's not going to be degenerating any further is probably the best way to go. Now, like anything else, we can have a number of other simple things like a contusion, and this is going to be just due to contact. So just essentially taking a hard hit on the front of the hip. Obviously, we can strain nearly any single muscle. This is going to be an issue that happens more frequently when a muscle is very tired. So we want to make sure that we're getting someone well conditioned enough that they're going to be able to tolerate the loads of the sport and that they're not going to have issues with these hamstring straining, which is going to be just damage to the muscle fibers. But what can happen when we damage these muscle fibers and we lay down scar tissue, scar tissue doesn't always lay down perfectly the way the muscle was set initially. Sometimes that scar tissue is gonna lay down on an acute angle. So now whenever those sarcomeres contract, instead of pulling in a nice smooth straight line, they're now pulling in an oblique angle. And that oblique angle obviously creates that shearing point again. And hence why people that have had like a really bad hamstrings pull or otherwise have a much greater amount of reoccurrence because we damaged that tissue. It didn't heal itself in the appropriate optimal angle and now there's always going to be that weak point that every time we pull hard, we're naturally starting to tear at it. Now, obviously, the same type situation can happen with adductors. So when in doubt, get real freaking strong. And the better job we do of getting muscles strong, making sure they can tolerate really heavy eccentric loading, the less likely that we are going to be to being injured. So let's talk about the knee joint, okay? This is what's gonna be known as a tibiofemoral joint. We've got our femur, we've got our tibia, our fibula is on the backside, and then our patella on the front side, okay? We have what's known as condyloid articulations. So we can see on both what's gonna be the medial and then the lateral condyloids. That is gonna give us that hinge and also increase that surface area that our knee happens to be articulating at. So that way we're going to go ahead and decrease the total amount of forces that effectively have to be pushed on one given location. Um, pardon me, folks, just one moment. The joys of living in this COVID world. Oh boy, guys. So now, why is the patella useful? Okay, well, that's because the patella itself is going to actually be massively improving our mechanical advantage of our quadriceps because it in turn is going to cause that instead of the femur on top of the tibia to go ahead and have to go, it puts an object further out. So now we've increased that angle that we're pulling from. Think about the wonderful trig components we've talked about, and that naturally is going to massively improve your leverage. So that way your quads are going to be far stronger than if you didn't have a tibia in the first place. Now, inside of those condyles, we're going to have what's known as your meniscus. Now, meniscus are essentially pads made of mostly collagen that in turn are going to even more so increase the surface area of contact between the tibia and the femur. So we effectively are going to be able to distribute that force over an even greater area. So we lower the total amount of pressure that has to go through the knee. 
Now, when we're looking at this, notice both these are superior views, okay? We've got our ACL, so that's gonna be our anterior cruciate ligament, and then we have our PCL, our posterior cruciate ligament. And we can see how they're naturally gonna come through in the center and twist. Now, here's the problem. We can see how right here, we've got that band for our medial meniscus, hence why people have a real bad ACL tear, can quite, quite frequently tear their medial meniscus at the same time when they happen to go through a traumatic injury because of the natural twisting and pulling and how these are gonna go ahead and relate. Also as well, this is our MCL. So when we talk about the knee triad of injury, when an athlete takes a hard enough hit, blows the ACL, tears up the medial meniscus, and it's going to also blow the MCL. So avoid, 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 but obviously, unfortunately, things are gonna happen. Now, your meniscus obviously, unfortunately can tear. Now this can be due to a vertical tear, this can be due to a radial tear, and then one of the rougher ones can be this, uh, what's known as a displaced bucket where this vertical tear has become so great. And this can often cause the knee to effectively catch in different positions. Now, we are gonna have those same types of bursts that we found in effectively the hip, only now they're gonna be in the knee, once again, serving as effectively padding to allow those muscles and tendons to pull accordingly without effectively causing a greater amount of discomfort because of not having the decrease in the coefficient of friction that this is going to allow. So cruciate ligaments are going to be on the inside. Collateral ligaments are going to be on the outside, okay? Medial meaning in between your legs, lateral meaning on the outsides of your legs. And then whether it's anterior, it starts on the front from the tibia or posterior starts from the back from your tibia. Now, the popliteus, which is an incredibly small muscle in humans, is going to be effectively what allows us to get that first little unlock of the knee, essentially putting ourselves into a little bit of flexion. But the muscles that are really giving us the flexion is going to be the hamstring. So we talked about our semitendinous, semimembranous, and then our biceps femoris. Now, notice this is going to be assisted not just by the gracilis and the sartorius, which is not really that impressive, much less the popliteus, but our gastrocnemius actually is going to be going to be contributing because it's going to go effectively through two sides. Now, what's interesting is the semitendinous and semimembranous are into the medial side of the tibia, whereas the femoris in the lateral side. So while you guys are sitting there, I want you guys to go ahead and turn your foot in, turn your foot out. And if your knee's bent, you're gonna actually feel how you're gonna be able to rotate your knee joint. And that's thanks to your hamstrings. So now when we're talking about ways to help decrease risk of ACL tear, congratulations, get stronger hamstrings. And that in turn is gonna go ahead and keep us hopefully from of not having issues with that type of damage. Now, we can see how the gastroc itself, notice right there, guys, it's gonna go through our calcaneus tendon, also known as our Achilles tendon, all the way up into the posterior aspect of the femur is gonna be its origin. And effectively, these combined are going to be how we can also get an effective flexion. So if you're doing like really heavy leg curls, bodyweight hamstring exercises is a great example of really feeling how gastroc can help. Um, myself, if I can really maximally utilize my gastroc, I can typically do a couple bodyweight hams, but if I'm not able to use my gastroc just because of foot placement, I am I'm not able to do a uh, bodyweight hamstring curl uh, on my own. So now, the notice again with gastroc, it's going to happen to be effectively a two joint muscle. Okay, your soleus is just a one joint and that's gonna be underneath your gastroc just attaching to the tibia, but then through the calcaneus tendon into the calcaneus bone, which is gonna go ahead and give us plantar flexion. So pushing our toes into the ground. Now the gastroc typically is far higher in type two muscle fiber. So this is going to be really our power muscle whereas the soleus is much more type one. And this is going to be obviously a very aerobic, more postural, keeping ourselves upright. And due to these fiber type differences, it can give you a little bit of information on kind of how to train things a little bit differently, but then also getting an idea of obviously which muscles are gonna be utilized in which situations. Now, 
when it comes to knee extensors, the only one that's a two joint muscle is going to be a rectus femoris, and that's going to be the one on the very top. From there, we've got our vastus medialis, our vastus lateralis, and our vastus intermedius. These four are going to go and contract to go and get our knee to extend. Our VMO and VL, notice how they're pulling in oblique angles. So this is why having appropriate strength in your quads, and then there's some arguments about making sure you're developing your vastus medialis, so that way your patellar tendon is going to be articulating correctly through your knee joint so that it's not going to be pulling an acute angle, which can lead to some potential problems over a long enough period of time. Now, what is the tibio-talar joint? This is going to be that hinge where we've got the convex central surface of the talus, where it's going to now articulate with the concave surface of the tibia. And this is what we think of as the ankle. So it's going to effectively be a lot of different fibrous tissue where we're going to, sorry, the distal tibiofibular joint. So the bottom of the leg, this is going to be pretty much held together by a really, really strong amount of effectively collagen. So really fibrous tissue that's going to hold them together. So we can see how we've got our tibia and our fibula. So you can see that tibiofibular joint, which is being held together mostly just through collagen. We then have our talus, which is sitting directly on top of our calcaneus. And this in turn is going to go ahead and give us the basics of our ankle. So we think about flexion and extension. Now we've got a lot of muscles going through here. So when we're talking about uh, dorsiflexion, so lifting our foot up off the ground, this can be being done mostly by our tibialis anterior, but our extensor digitorum longus is going to help as will our peroneus tertius and our extensor hallucis longus. Now, digitorum longus, notice it's gonna hit our four toes. Hallucis, that is going to our big toe and the peroneus tertius, which is going to be going and effectively pulling up from the lateral aspect, whereas the tibialis anterior is more from the medial. Now, it is important to understand that we wanna be strong in all these angles, but we're also gonna talk about both eversion and inversion. And one thing that we don't get into in great depth, but is very important, which is going to be making sure that we have not just a strong ankle, but a very strong foot. So now when we think about plantar flexion, then we've got this big gastroc and this big soleus underneath it. Now they're both attaching through the calcaneus tendon and this in turn is gonna give us plantar flexion. Now it is being effectively assisted by a number of different muscles, but when we say assisted, they are giving small single digit percentage additions to what we're getting from that gastroc and that soleus. Another thing to keep in mind is look at how long this tendon is and also pretty thick. So one thing to keep in mind when you're training calves, if we have, or training any muscle, if we have a really long tendon, tendons work kind of like bungee cords. They distribute force and they're also gonna give us that bounce. So when you see people just like bouncing through a lot of reps on the calf raise, their muscle is not really doing much work. It's just staying in the same position and letting the tendon bounce. So instead it's important to think about a slow eccentric and a bit slower of a concentric, or at least holding the top and holding the bottom for a moment, because otherwise you're using more of the elastic components of your body and not so much the contractile, which we're gonna to touch on in a future chapter as well. So the subtalar joint, okay, this is gonna be where we're gonna have our different facets of the talus. We're gonna articulate with the systemum calculum talli on the calcaneus. This is where we're gonna get are eversion and inversion, okay? Now, when we're talking about pronating the, hurt, uh, pronating the foot, also known as eversion, this is gonna be done by through what's known as abduction. So that's gonna be turning that foot out. And you can see this whenever we happen to be in dorsiflexion. And then when we talk about supination, which can be inversion, we are now going to see this more in plantar flexion. So pushing that foot into the ground. So when we're talking about pronating that foot. Notice we're turning it out from the inside. This is where we're gonna see the ankles falling in. Now this is a problem. If the ankles are falling in, usually the knees are gonna be falling in as well. So we're gonna find issues effectively up and down the entire kinetic chain whenever we happen to have this type of situation. Same situation we talk about supination. So now we're rotating the ankle in, which in turn is gonna be pushing the knee out. So we're not gonna have effectively as much of a straight line. Now. Tarsal, metal, tarsal, and intermetal tarsal joints. Now we're talking about non-axial joints that 
uh, permit only gliding movements, but they do allow movements. Overall, guys, you've got, it's, it's a pretty crazy number. It, it turns out to be about, um, you've got about 34 different joints in your foot and about 20 odd muscles that are gonna help move it. So yeah, your foot's a semi uh, rigid unit, but it's meant to move and be flexible as we go over uneven surfaces. But for the most part, all of us ever encounter when we're moving around every day is flat surfaces. And if you have to walk on a Lego, may God rest, may God uh, grant you peace because that hurts. But in reality, our feet are meant to be pretty flexible, much like our hand and articulate into different positions. And the way that we live our lives in shoes, and once again, living in a life or a world that's been mostly paved flat for us, and we go upstairs, which is still flat surfaces, our foot, as far as the strength and its ability to articulate, can easily go down. And now that's why you have a lot of issues with issues with ankle mobility. When you have issues with ankle mobility, that in turn shows itself with putting compensation patterns into the hip and the knee. And we talked about earlier how you don't want the knee to have to compensate for a lack of mobility somewhere else, which in turn is going to increase your risk of injury. So the metatarsal phalangeal and interphalangeal joints, now we're talking about effectively our toes, okay? And these are gonna be conoloid and hinge joints. Now, this is important because it's gonna allow us to have that weight shift as we're moving and giving us a greater amount of stability and obviously a greater amount of effective uh, central area that we happen to be pushing down into the ground with. So we're also gonna have our arches. So this is gonna be a medial and latitude or lateral longitudinal arches that go from the calcaneus to the metatarsals and tarsals. Now the transverse arch itself is gonna be formed by those metatarsal bones. So naturally how our feet are gonna go and sit up. This also gives us another elastic component. And this is gonna be held in place somewhat by what is known as our plantar fascia, which is gonna be running the length of that foot where we're going to effectively be utilizing it to deal with effectual weight bearing exercises. So the mechanical energy that we're gonna get from effectively putting stretch on this fascia is gonna be returned to us, which is gonna help us move forward in the push-off, which in turn is going to allow us to effectively be even more efficient with movements like walking and running. Now, there is a whole lot of muscles that are going to be, excuse me, important for essentially our flexion and extension in our foot. I do not expect you guys to memorize all of them. It is pretty intense. So when it says flexor, remember we're flexing. When it says extension, we're extending. So effectively, what we've got here, guys, is this is going to be a view from the bottom of the foot on these two. And then this is going to go ahead and be from the top of the foot. And so we can see how we don't really have any muscles, per se, in our toes. It's all going to be in our foot in general. But whenever I talk about how there's a huge number of muscles going through, that are articulating with all of these bones. A lot of us don't even think about having a single muscle in, or think about having many muscles in our foot, much less how strong should they be, what should they be capable of. So what muscles are gonna effectively be useful for that inversion, inversion, where we touched on that earlier. So we talked about inversion, so turning in, that's gonna be that tibialis posterior and tibialis anterior. And then eversion, we're gonna be talking about are peroneus longus brevis and peroneus tertius. Now, there's a number of potential misalignments that we can have in the lower extremity. The first one we're gonna look at is gonna be effectively changes on the knee angles. So it goes from varus, which would be effectively someone that's bow-legged to valgus, which is gonna be someone that is having to be knock-kneed. We can already see when you look at this image how we're gonna have an asymmetry of force going through the knee joint. And this is obviously going to be over a long enough period of time, like putting uneven wear on your tires, which is going to increase our risk of injury. We then have what's known as femoral antiversion. And this is going to be effectively a rotating through the femur that's much greater. That's naturally going to create more of that type of internal rotation at the hip, which notice the knees are actually going to be kind of relatively knock kneed. Um, and once again, we can be putting an undue amount of stress on the knee joints. Like look, look when the knees are facing forward, how wide the child's feet happen to be uh, facing out to the side. And then obviously when those feet are all the way internally rotated, 
how much further those knees are going to be going with it. Now, there's also going to be retroversion, which is going to be the exact opposite type of situation where we're now going to be externally rotated as opposed to be internally rotated when we have to be neutral, which once again, asymmetry of forces on the joint over long periods of time can be more problematic. So effectively, if you've got major versions of retroversion or antroversion, you're probably not going to be a really good long distance runner, but that's okay. There's a lot of things you can still do. It's just being mindful of the fact that based upon your skeletal development, there's going to be different things that are going to be effectively a little more difficult than what your body is going to be able to tolerate easily. Now, we then have variations in what's known as our femoral angles. So you can see the femoral neck. Now notice normal is from 120 to 135 degrees. When we happen to be in much steeper of an angle, this is going to be what's known as coxa valga. When we happen to be in a much flatter angle, this can be coxa vera. Now, just looking at this, guys, which individual do you think is going to have a disadvantage if they're trying to build up to doing something like a full splits? The coxa vera. Bingo. Because figure as we're going out, this effectively our trochanter might eventually literally be hitting into our iliacus. So exactly. Some of this coxa valga, that could give them an advantage if they're trying to do something like learning the splits, because it turns out they're not going to be having issues with running into bony limitations as easily. Now, the broader the hips are, the greater we're going to have what's known as our Q angle. And this is the angle of our femur leading down into our tibia. This greater angle in turn is going to put a greater amount of stress effectively going through the knee joints when we're running. Hence why you don't see a lot of really good long distance runners with wide hips. Now you can be male or female. The key is males in general tend to have narrower hip angles, which in turn is going to actually make it orthopedically a little bit easier to get into doing very long distances. Now, just like we can have the torsion in our uh, femurs, we're going to then have these type of situations potentially going down also into our tibias, where notice now with tibial torsion, thanks to effectively the natural change in the angle, we're going to have a situation where the feet are turned in or turned out even when the knees are translating forward, which once again can lead itself into a number of issues. And obviously there's a whole lot of potential knee problems that you can find yourselves in. Chondromalacia being one of them where effectively we have the uncomfortable rubbing of that patella up against that femur, thanks to doing a lot of really high, uh, essentially tension work that those tissues are not quite prepared for and not wanting to tolerate for that much. So we just went through the lower extremity very quickly. Now, my goal for you guys is we're gonna now get in our groups and we're going to have you guys try to work on your projects a little bit more. And if I were you guys, I would focus on trying to make sure that you solve for effectively, you know, try to start breaking down what would be those torques, those forces, those accelerations that in those velocities you're going to find at your joint at the different parts of the movement. So if you guys haven't already scheduled the time that you guys are going to video your movement, you should do so immediately. And this is another chance that you guys are going to have to at least correspond and make sure you're corresponding with your classmates that happen to not be in the lecture today. So whenever you guys are ready, go ahead and put up in the uh, chat effectively what group you happen to be in.
So Jordan, I'm still waiting to hear from you. Um, Lexi, we're gonna go ahead and have you work with them. Um, if that doesn't happen to work too well, then no offense, we'll have you hop in at least with the, uh, the tennis group or the baseball group, just so you can have somebody to talk to. But let's go ahead, guys. It is 1021. Oh, okay. Jordan, you're in the basketball. Okay, yeah, sounds good. No offense, you guys, the only ones from your groups today. So have fun, do your best. And uh, it's 1021 right now. We're going to plan on coming back at 10, 1030 to 1035. Send me a message. I'll try to hop between the rooms a little bit, make sure he's doing okay. And then from there, we'll go ahead and plan on getting into effectively how that math is breaking down for you in general. So have fun, guys. Go ahead and get after it. Okay, so now that we got everybody back, yeah. So thank you, uh, Colton, for providing. Um, yeah, dear God, man. <laughs> and obviously, you weren't just laying down on two screws when they x-rayed you. Instead, that's what's keeping your SI joints uh, from moving. Okay. Yeah. That's... That's intense. Um, does it give you much trouble when you're moving around and everything, or do you even remember? Um, when I don't work out sometimes, I work at Amazon, so just standing in one spot kind of hurts. But if I work out the day before, it's not too bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's one of those things you kind of have to stay moving, otherwise it just compounds. Yes. Yeehaw. And thank you for providing the picture. I'll switch to, I guess, the happier knee picture. So <laughs> um, one thing to keep in mind, guys, once again, we'll talk about the ability of all of your tissues to effectively recover is effectively your tendons, your muscles, and your bones, aside from your bone marrow, have very little natural blood supply to those own areas. So the way you get a greater amount of effective recovery you get more nutrients going to that area. So you're removing the metabolic waste and you're going and delivering not just oxygen, but amino acids, uh, fats, and glucose is through movement. And this becomes the really difficult thing because if something really hurts, do you really want to train? Uh, and obviously the answer tends to be, no, you don't want to train if something really hurts. So when you're working with athletes, when you're working with yourself or otherwise, it's important to make sure that we regress exercises wherever they need to be so that way you can be physically active without causing greater damage to already damaged tissues. So that's why we wanna have progressions, making your exercises harder, just like we wanna have regressions, ways to make them easier whenever obviously we need to make them easier. So um, with that said, you guys had a chance to work in your groups. So you guys have any questions that you guys would like me to field uh, about your exams, expectations, uh, labs. Remember, you don't have to come to the lab for doing your lab assignments. There's going to be video examples of that in the uh, YouTube channel that you can go ahead and just watch those, copy down those numbers and figure them out. Uh, when you're doing the center of mass on the table, that one is a complicated math problem because we're effectively balancing levers. And obviously one side of the table is on the force plate, the other, other side isn't. And we're trying to figure out where essentially what percentage of your height your center of gravity is. Remember, your center of gravity is always going to be inside of your body. And it's going to be pretty close to being in the midpoint of your body. So if you find the 70th percentile or the 30th, you either got some insanely massive cankles or you have just the bro at the wreck and all you ever do is train upper body. So, and you may or may not have legs. So we need to make sure that we obviously have, we're doing our math and we're thinking our way through on those. Um, are there any other questions, comments, concerns? Otherwise, we'll go ahead and call it a little early for you guys today so you can hopefully get with your groups, keep working on your projects. Do keep in mind, we have some assignments looking at what muscles are gonna be being utilized during which movements of which activities that you guys need to be working on as well. And so that's going to be something that's relatively simple, but I'm trying to look for you guys thinking things through. So for example, and now I'm gonna take it away so you can't do it, if we're doing something like the bench press, well, it turns out when we're lowering the bar, we're eccentrically lengthening our triceps, deltoids, pecs, and then on the concentric, we are going to be 
shortening our triceps, anterior deltoids, and pecs. Real complicated. Uh, a little bit more involved in that, if you're doing it correctly, you should have a static contraction the entire time of your mid trap and your rhomboids so you can keep your shoulders back. And we might see a little bit of lat activation in certain uh, portions of the range of motion, but not much of them. Um, that being said, you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, anything you guys want me to touch on? Otherwise, is this a, sorry, is this a good time to ask the uh, um, stress and strain question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that was um, a great question. Thanks. So um, we were looking at, for the rest of the class, we were looking at um, uh, the bone stress curves. And um, I was wondering what the difference between stress reactions, stress fractures, and normal fractures are, as far as if they're the same point in that curve for different lengths of time or different points in that curve. Okay. Those are two separate realities in general. Okay, so when we're talking about a fracture, now we're talking about you have literally broken the bone. So that's where you've hit that curve where it just ends. Make sense? Yes. And, or you've hit that kink where you've now somehow really bent your bone, which that's, ugh, that's not going to be too pleasant because you probably also did at least not necessarily a stress fracture. That's going to be more like a hairline fracture. So like we haven't fully broken the bone. We've done damage. That's where those curves are prevalent. Now, the example that you're talking about when it comes to stress reactions and stress fractures, this is from excessive impacts and or just excessive yeah, impacts on the bone when it, we think about effectively how much time we give the bone to recover between each of those stressful events. Now, quite frequently, when we're talking about stress and recovery, we're, we have a mismatch. So we're applying way more stress than we can recover from. So if we gave them enough calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K, and time to recover, we'd never get into the issues where we had those stress fractures and those uh, the initial, which is going to be those stress reactions, where we're starting to demineralize our bones and we're demineralizing them faster than we can effectively remineralize them, where we're running into, once again, sustained damage. So those are actually two separate ways of looking at it. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Now, here's where it gets weird because when we go far enough into the stress reactions, into full stress fractures, we saw those curves. Well, instead of that curve, like you can tolerate this amount of force and that's where you kind of, you hit your first kink and then that's where you totally broke it. Now we're bringing it all down because we don't mm -hmm. have strong enough bones. You can actually then fracture your bone because congratulations, you've made them weaker so they can't handle those forces in the first place. That makes sense. Thank you. So whenever you guys were, you know, I gave you the example or the question, had you guys actually Google, okay, it takes 5,000 Newtons to break a bone. It takes 5,000 Newtons to break certain bones. Okay. Does not take 5,000 Newtons to break a chicken bone. How many of you guys can easily, if you're having chicken legs or chicken wings, you can just, and that breaks it. Now, I mean, unless you've got some freaking massive forearms, I doubt many of you guys can easily produce 5,000 newtons of force. Instead, all of our tissues, when it comes to bones, are going to be, their strength is based upon that bone mineral density. So essentially how much calcium we have and other minerals per square centimeter, and then how much of that bone we have in the first place. So obviously a bigger, thicker bone or a bigger bone that in turn is a denser bone is a much stronger bone. So we could, there's no way you can do it on a, well, you can do it on a living human, but they really wouldn't like it. We couldn't, you'd have a hard time taking somebody's femur out and then just snapping it over your leg. But if you had like a really older grandmother that happens to be or a very old woman that happens to be osteoporotic. So they've got, you know, hardcore osteoporosis. I'm sure a number of you guys could probably potentially snap their femur. Definitely probably something like the radius of their ulna, simply because those bones are so brittle at that point. So great question. I did not want to try to reply to that uh, on the chat because that would have been a little difficult. Because um, obviously there's some nuance. 
but yeah, please guys, yeah, join the Discord if you haven't already. If the link isn't working anymore, let me know and I'll put a new one up. And that's just an easy way to, I mean, if you send me a message, um, I'll get on there and talk to you guys. I uh, recreationally play some Rocket League with some friends as a little, I guess, COVID hobby. Um, and so I usually check that Discord pretty much at the same time. And I'm gonna try to in the future make that how I do my office hours, just be on the chat in the Discord. So if somebody wants to talk to me, they can just talk to me, so. Nice, well, congratulations. The getting out 10 minutes early has now faded away to three. So if there's no other questions, comments, concerns, you guys have yourselves a great day and I will see you guys on Tuesday of next week when we are gonna be getting into the joys of bone itself. So have a great one guys and bye-bye.